Hello again, Physics 30s. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about an important experiment that is going to lead us to modify our model of the atom so that we can properly explain things like the black body radiation curve and also why different elements have different bright line or emission spectra. I'm not going to state any learning outcomes today. There's no direct ones to this experiment. However, the study of this experiment is going to lead to, again, a development of a model that's going to be very important in the next lesson. So we're going to examine an experiment from Frank and Hertz, which are two separate scientists and I have no idea what their first names are. What they did is they fired high energy electrons through mercury vapor. So here's a container of mercury vapor. And what we're going to do is we're going to fire electrons through the mercury vapor and then we're going to observe the energy of the electrons after they leave the mercury vapor so let's start off with this begin by firing uh, an electron that has a kinetic energy of 2.0 electron volts when it goes through the mercury vapor well nothing happens the electron just comes back out with the same kinetic energy how about if we increase the kinetic energy to 3.0 electron volts, passes through the mercury vapor and nothing happens. How about 4.0 electron volts of kinetic energy through that mercury vapor? Nothing. How about 5.0 electron volts of kinetic energy? Okay, now something actually happens. When the electron leaves the mercury vapor, it's moving quite a bit slower. In fact, what it's doing is uh, it's only carrying 0.1 electron volts of kinetic energy, which is telling me that something happened in the mercury vapor where it absorbed 4.9 electron volts. And by the way, if you're wondering where I got that number from, you do subtraction. 5.0 minus 0.1 is 4.9. How about 6.0 electron volts of kinetic, uh, kinetic energy for my electron through the mercury vapor? Okay, well, it comes back slower, and it's not really so much the kinetic energy of the electron that's leaving as much as we're starting to notice a pattern now. So if six electron volts kinetic energy of my electron goes in, I only have 1.1 coming out, 6.0 minus 1.1 is 4.9 is being absorbed. So there, there, there's something about this number the mercury vapor likes assuming you have sentient and it could actually like something. Okay, how about 7.0 electron volts of uh, kinetic energy of my electron? Any idea as to how much is going to be absorbed? If you said 2.1, uh, sorry, 4.9 electron volts absorbed, leaving you with a kinetic energy of 2.1 electron volts, you are kind of right. Sometimes when we do this, so we, we have to fire multiples electro, multiple electrons in. Sometimes when we fire it in, we get electrons that come out with 2.1 electron volts of kinetic energy. That tells me that 4.9 electron volts is being absorbed. However, when I fire other electrons with a kinetic energy of 7.0 electron volts, I have some come out with an energy of 6.7. And then 7 minus 0 0.3 would be telling me 6.7 electron volts is being absorbed. There's no way to know what's going to happen next. This is completely probability based. Think of it as like a coin flip in terms of identifying what, which one, wh which of these is going to happen. Is it going to be 4.9 absorbed or is it going to be 6.7 absorbed? We don't know. How about 9.0 electron volts of kinetic energy? We have even more possibilities now. Sometimes when I fire the electrons, I have the electrons come up with 4.1 electron volts of kinetic energy, which tells me that 4.9 is being absorbed. Sometimes electrons with 2.3 electron volts of kinetic energy come out, which tells me 6.7 is being absorbed. And sometimes I get 0 0.2 electron volts of kinetic energy coming out, which tells me that 9 minus 0 0.2 is 8.8 .8 electron volts of kinetic energy being absorbed. The important thing here is that this mercury vapor is being picky 
It's being very choosy about how much energy it actually wants to absorb. So here's what we notice. The mercury vapor could only absorb energies, very discrete amount of energies at 4.86 electron volts, 6.67 electron volts, and 8.84. And I believe if we start to increase the kinetic energy of the electrons even further, we get even more possibilities, but we're not going to worry about that right now. So what conclusion can we draw from this? The atoms that make up the mercury, they are being very picky. They're being very choosy about how much energy they want to be it, that, that they want to absorb. So what they're doing specifically is they're only absor absorbing very discrete amounts or quanta of energy. Just remember, we talk about that word quantization. Quantization means that in a very loose definition, numbers just can't come in any random values. Again, like we talk about the charge in an object, it must be a whole number multiple of the elementary charge. When we talk about photon energy, your total photon energy, if you fired a bunch of photons, must be a whole number multiple of the energy contained in one photon. So right here, again, we're, being, we're only allowing specific numbers to be absorbed. So only certain quanta of energy are being absorbed. What Frankenhertz then concluded is they, they adjusted the model of the atom to implement something called excitation states. Okay, so let's explain what an excitation state is. Electrons in an atom normally exist in something called a ground state. I'm sure your chemistry teacher could give you a much better definition of what a ground state is, but a ground state is kind of just like a really low energy level. It's like a reference energy level. It's where your electrons would prefer to exist. So under normal circumstances, they would be in the ground state, your low energy state. We're going to use it as kind of like a reference energy point. So we're going to say at the ground state that our electrons in the mercury vapor have zero electron volts of energy in the ground state. When you give electrons in the mercury enough energy, they actually jump into an excited energy state. However, there are only certain excitation states that are going to be allowed. And in fact, electrons cannot exist in intermediate states. They can't exist between them. Okay, we need to visualize this somehow because this is, this is suddenly getting really complicated very fast. Okay, so I'm going to construct something called an energy level diagram and we'll look at what these different energy states are. So as I mentioned, the ground state is like the lowest energy state and it's where electrons in the mercury vapor would prefer to exist, okay? Exist in like a low energy state. So we can look at this as, let's draw an electron here. Okay, so under normal circumstances, electrons would be in the ground state. If we give them enough energy, and by the way, if you're wondering, so this would be an electron in the mercury. So mercury is Hg. If you give them enough energy, you can get them to jump up, okay? They can actually like instantaneously jump up to a higher energy state. Well, where, do, where does this energy come from? Well, that's from those electrons we're firing from the outside. So from the outside, we are firing those electrons with a specific amount of energy. And then when they collide at this one, they'll transfer some of their energy to the mercury one. And then your other electron just leaves the mercury vapor with whatever energy is kind of left over. The first excitation state would be associated with an energy of 4.86 electron volts. I think we had 4.9 electron volts on the first slide, but I think more specifically it's 4.86. So if you're wondering why did nothing happen initially, if we go back here, why did nothing happen when we fired electrons with two electron volts, three electron volts, four electron volts of kinetic energy in? 
because they don't have enough energy to get you to the first excitation state. And you can't just go part of the way up and then come down. They either go to the state or they don't do it. There's no in between. They can't exist between the energy states. So the ground state we're going to refer to as n equals one, and our first excitation state is going to be n equals two. The second excitation state where we have n equals three, you'd need 6.67 electron volts to get there. So that's why we only started to observe, uh, observe those other numbers once we started to fire in the seven electron volts of kinetic energy. Because then we actually had enough energy to do both. We could go to the first excitation state or the second one. Then we have the third excitation state, which would be n equals four. And there I would have uh, my the energy required to get to that state would be 8.84 electron volts. Eventually, you're going to get to the point where we have something called ionization. Ionization is the incoming electron transfers so much energy to your electron in the mercury vapor that it actually has enough energy just to leave the atom. So it would escape it and leave the atom with a positive charge. So it would turn the atom into an ion. Uh, I believe the ionization state, if we used an n value, would be like infinity. Uh, you'll notice right here, there's a bit of like confusion between like the value of n. It's like you're like, oh, n equals two is the first excitation state, and n equals three is the second one. Like, wouldn't it be a lot nicer if like the first excitation state was n equals one? Uh, we'll readdress this problem in the next lesson. We're just going to rename them stationary states and we'll get rid of this problem where the, the, not, the n value is not matching which excitation state you're in. Okay, so just in summary, electrons are normally in the ground state. And again, I said zero electron volts of energy to be in the ground state. It doesn't mean they, they, they have no energy, it's just a reference amount of energy. That's where they prefer to be. But if you can give them enough energy, specifically, you need to give them enough energy so they can get to one of those excitation states, then uh, they'll jump up. And again, we don't know what state it's going to jump up to. Like if we have, uh, if we fired in an electron with 10.0 electron volts of kinetic energy, this electron here, the one, the mercury, it could jump to the first excitation state. It could jump to the second one. It could jump to the third one. It's just all probability based. Now, here's the interesting that ha thing that happens. These electrons don't want to be in those excitation states. In fact, what happens is after they get to an excitation state, they always want to go back down to the ground state. They want to be as lazy as possible. They want to be in the lowest energy state they possibly can. But in terms of conservation of energy, if these electrons gain energy when they jump up, when they jump down, they're going to give off some energy. And it turns out they give off energy in the form of a photon. Okay, so let's go back to this illustration. So we will follow like one of these electrons here and see what it actually does. So if this guy jumped up to the first excitation state, it's eventually going to jump back down. When it jumps back down, it's going to give energy off in the form of a single photon. And if it gained 4.86 electron volts of energy, it's going to then give off a photon with that amount of energy. If we had an electron, the mercury gain energy where it jumped up to this guy, and then it jumped all the way back down like this, then it would emit a photon. So let's draw my photon. Except this time, this photon would have more energy. The bigger the jump, the bigger the energy the photon's going to be emitted. So what Frank and Hertz did is they measured the wavelengths of all these different photons that were being emitted by the excited mercury atoms. So let's just modify our definition of excitation now. So I believe in the last lesson, I said, if you excite a gas, you just make it hot by putting electricity through it. What it really means is when a gas gets excited, 
the electrons within the gas are going to these higher energy states. An unexcited would be there in the ground state. Okay, let's look at a chart to kind of summarize some of this information. So we're looking at the wavelength of a photon being emitted and also the energy of a photon. Okay, so in one situation, a photon with a wavelength of 686.8 nanometers is emitted, and that would correspond to a photon energy of 1.81. And again, you could calculate the photon energy just by going E equals HC over lambda, use Planck's formula. 686.8 nanometers is red light. There's a bit of a problem because this 1.81 number, I don't see it anywhere on my energy level diagram. Okay, if I go back here, I don't see a 1.81. Okay, Frankenhertz also noted that photons with 572.9 nanometers were being emitted. And if you convert that to energy, it's 2.17. Uh, 2.17 electron volts of photon energy. That's probably getting more into the orange part of the spectrum. 312.3 nanometers, that's actually out of the visible spectrum, so we're dealing with ultraviolet light now. I'm not really sure what they did to measure the ultraviolet light, but I'm assuming these physicists are smart and capable of doing this. And again, we get a number that we're not seeing anywhere. So we have a photon energy of 1.81, we have 2.17 and we have 3.98. Okay, I'm not seeing it. How about this one? 254.2 electron volts, those are uh, nanometers. Convert that to energy. Then we get a number we're familiar with, 4.86. And then 186.4, we get another number we're familiar with, 6.67. And then 140.6, we get 8.84. So three of the six photons we're absorb, uh, observing have energies that I can see based on the energy level diagram. So let's predict if we can identify where uh, an electron starts and where it ends up. Now, when I say the initial state, the initial state is not a reference to the ground state. We're talking about a photon being emitted when it jumps down. So and going from initial to final state, that would be a jump back down for your electron. Okay, so let's look at this here. When would I emit a photon of 4.86 electron volts of energy? Okay, well, let's go back here. This slide's getting like really jumbled. How about we just erase all this stuff? Okay. If an electron went from here to there, and then jump back down, it would emit a photon with an energy of 4.86 EV. That would be a jump from two to one, okay? Two to one would give me that number. How about the other numbers that I see? And I'm just gonna clear the slide off because it's just gonna get really messy fast again. Uh, okay. If an electron jumped to this state right here and then jumped all the way back down, it would emit a photon that would correspond to a jump from 6.67 back down to zero. So what jump is occurring here? You're going from n equals three to n equals one. And then if we had An electron, mercury, electron, the mercury vapor, jump all the way up to this state, and then jump all the way back down. It would emit a photon that corresponds with that jump. So if it gained ten, uh, eight point eight four, and going up, it would then emit a photon of eight point eight four electron volts going down. Well, what about these other numbers? So this would be a jump from four to one. So let's go back here. Okay, two to one would be, so when you're emitting a photon with 4.86 electron volts of photon energy, that's a jump from two to one, 6.67 electron volts of photon energy, that's a three to one jump. 
and 8.84 would be a four to one jump, but I still am missing these three numbers here. Now here's the trick with this. It turns out that you can actually make intermediate jumps. And here's what I mean by this. So let's take one of these guys and let's say it goes up to this excitation state here. It is possible for this guy, instead of jumping all the way back down to the ground state, it just does this jump. Okay, it just goes here first. Well, it could actually do two separate jumps. It could do this one and then that one. Well, in going from three to two, what energy of a photon would be emitted? You can actually just subtract the difference in the energy levels. So you could go 6.67 electron volts minus 4.86 and that would give you I believe that would be the jump from three to two and the other ones that also represent intermediate jumps if you're emitting a photon with uh, energy of 2.17 electron volts that would be a jump from n equals four to three or if you're emitting photons with an energy of 3.98 electron volts, it'd be a jump from four to two. Again, generally the higher the jump, the, the bigger the amount of photon energy is going to be emitted. But just be aware that, yeah, you don't have to make like, uh, like these electrons can do one of two things. They can take like the long way, they can make two separate jumps, or they can just make the jump in a single shot. To make the jump in a single shot, they would emit one photon. If they make two individual jumps, they'd emit two photons. And again, there's no way we can know which one it's going to do. It's just completely random probability in terms of like which jump the electrons are going to do, but it's going to do a combination of both of them if you do the experiment multiple times. Turns out these excitations it's can explain both the dark line and absorption spectrum or the bright line or the emission spectra. I'll talk more about that in the next lesson once we do like, like officially formalize our next model of the atom and talking about the Bohr model. And then I'll come back and explain the absorption emission spectrum and also go back to the, the black body radiation curve, which we've not explained yet. Okay, this is an energy level diagram for hydrogen. And we're going to look at it from two perspectives. So one perspective would be an energy level diagram like we drew before. So your ground state would be where you're saying you have no energy. So that'd be N equals one. And then you'd have N equals two. So different atoms are going to have different energy values for your excitation states. We'd have n equals three, this one would be n equals four, this one would be n equals five, and the 13.6 would be the ionization energy, so that'd be n is infinity. By the way, if you're wondering why my writing looks so robotic, I'm using a different uh, tablet that uh, doesn't seem to like to do curves well, likes to do a lot of like chunky blocks or straight lines. Anyways, who cares? Okay, so uh, yeah, if you look on the right-hand side of the diagram, we have an electron and basically the energy to get to the first excitation state would be 10.2. To get to the second excitation state, you'd need 12.1. Third, 12.8. Fourth could be 13.1. However, physicists, or in the last one would be to get this electron to completely jump out of the atom, to leave it, you would need 13.6 electron volts of energy. However, what physicists like to do, and I don't know what the explanation is for this, is they like to view this from a different reference point. So in the diagram on the right-hand side, we like to use the reference point as the ground state. So from the ground state, we'd ask, how much energy do you need to get to that next excitation state? The other perspective that physicists prefer is they like to view things using the ionization as your reference. So think of it like this. 
if you had an electron located at this position, which is at ionization, how much energy would you need to get an electron out of the atom? Well, nothing here because you're already at the ionization energy. How about the, if the electron is right here and you wanted it to get ionized, to leave the atom, you would need 0.54 electron volts of energy. And what if you're down here, you would need to get it to leave the atom, you need 3.4 electron volts of energy. And obviously if you're all the way down the ground state, you're gonna need a ton of energy, 13.6, electron volts of energy to make it to leave. If you're wondering why it's a negative, like I'm not totally clear on the explanation for this. I think of it like a, kind of like a hypothetical because you're, you're hypothetically asking yourself, like if an electron was here, how much energy would it need to leave the actual atom? Well, the electrons aren't there. So because they're not there, I kind of just think of it as like a deficit amount of energy that you would need in order to get it to leave if it was at that position. So although it probably makes a lot more sense to view things from the ground state, we're actually going to, in our mathematical equations and the next thing, view things from ionization, which just tells you from the perspective of ionization, how much energy would you need to give the electron to get it to leave? I guess physicists just care a lot about ionizing atoms or chemists anyways. Okay. So here is an, again another uh, energy level diagram this is again of hydrogen now the one thing i wanted to point out is i kind of said that the bigger the jump the bigger energy photons being emitted so bigger jump down higher energy photon emitted. Okay, so if you look at this energy level diagram, the biggest energy difference that can occur is if you go from n equals two, to n equals one. If you had an electron make a jump down here, that is the biggest photon you could actually emit. And it turns out for hydrogen, this is how we emit ultraviolet radiation, so UV. And remember, the way that we emit electromagnetic radiation, which, which electromagnetic radiation, according to our wave particle model, is a photon, is we need an accelerating charge. Now, I don't know, I don't know what is going on, like how this jump is happening. Like, is it just teleporting? Is it like instantaneously jumping? All we know is we, it, they can't exist between energy states, but somehow they're accelerating. So when an electron jumps from one state to another, it does in some capacity accelerate. And when it does it, it emits ultra it emits a photon. If you have a really, really big jump, okay, you can admit an ultraviolet photon. So that's where we get uh, ultraviolet photons from. In terms of visible light, this is for hydrogen, we make some smaller jumps. So some smaller jumps would be if we have an electron go from n equals three to two, then we emit a photon that would be red in color. Well, if there's a bunch of them emitted, we could perceive it as red. We couldn't detect a single photon. Or if uh, you had a jump that went from n equals five. So if an electron up here down to this, we'd emit a higher frequency photon, which is blue. In fact, any jump to an n equals two level in hydrogen is going to result in you getting uh, visible light. So that's how we get visible light on the electromagnetic spectrum. We have uh, smaller energy level jumps. As for ultraviolet, is bigger energy level jumps. And then uh, infrared radiation would be a really, really tiny jump. So that could be like starting at n equals six and making a small jump to n equals four, in which case we'd emit uh, 
an infrared photon, which we obviously can't see. And yeah, just going back down to this bigger jump, higher energy of photon that is going to be emitted. And so that that's really the source of uh, your electromagnetic radiation for infrared visible light and for ultraviolet radiation. It is a, a transition of electrons between your, your uh, energy levels. Okay, that's it for this assignment, and uh, not this assignment, this lesson, and you can complete the hand in assignment called the Frank Hertz experiment. Although you might want to wait until I just do the next lesson where I talk about the Bohr model of the atom to do it, because by addressing the Bohr model of the atom, it might just build a bit better of an understanding of this atom we're looking at now. So maybe I'd hold off on this one uh, until the next lesson. Although you can do most, but there's just some questions where it does ask you to explain the emission and the absorption spectrum, which, which I haven't really done yet. I'll do it once I talk about the Bohr model of the atom, and I'll do that next time.